we cannot wait. We cannot wait to leave you alone in the waiting room, as we did, unfortunately, sometimes with other countries in the past. We have to engage with you, with civil society. But it's a very good thing to, to use the momentum and to make sure that we do as much as possible uh, to bring Ukraine and other member uh, candidate countries closer to the EU. European Union is not able to defend itself, to protect its democracies and, and freedoms. Without Ukraine, we will be lost. Hello and welcome to Ukraine in Flames, a special project by Ukraine Media Center and NGO Euro-Atlantic Force. And I'm your host, Miroslava Yeremkiv. In February, the European Economic and Social Committee, EESC, launched the Enlargement Candidate Member Initiative status. As part of this initiative, 131 civil society organizations from nine candidate countries will participate in the work of the committee. 21 EECC enlargement candidate members were elected from Ukraine. This initiative made the committee the first EU institution to offer the candidate countries a specific opportunity for involvement and participation. The initiative is designed as a one-year pilot project for 2024 and will be evaluated in December 2024. In today's episode, we're going to talk more about this initiative and why granting the status is important for Ukraine. If you want to learn more about the subject, please continue watching this video and subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss our videos in the future. The EESC is a unique forum for consultation, dialogue, and consensus between representatives from all sectors of organized civil society. These organizations often act as intermediaries between decision makers and the public, offering an avenue for people to play an active role in bringing about change or to support specific causes for the common good. Oliver Ropke, president of the European Economic and Social Committee, who launched this initiative. We'll talk more about it. We here in the ESC from day one of this uh, war of aggression against Ukraine, we were a strong supporter of Ukraine and of your civil society organizations. We will not stop here. We will never stop with this. Uh, you will have our uh, solidarity. And I think uh, uh, the close cooperation, the strong work of the civil society uh, platform, our joint work there, um, I think this is also very important because I believe that the future of Ukraine is in the EU, to be very clear. Um, we don't know when, but I think it's important that we have this political commitment. We were, I think, the first EU institution who was really calling for candidate status. And I think now we cannot wait. We cannot wait to leave you alone in the waiting room as we did Unfortunately, sometimes with other countries in the past, we have to engage with you, with civil society, uh, to help you to reach uh, the standards, not only the internal market standards, but also the standards in terms of fundamental rights, the rule of law, uh, the European pillar of social rights. And I know how big this challenge is during uh, this war and martial uh, law, but I have to say when we visited uh, Ukraine, Last year, I was really delighted by the resilience of civil society organizations, also by the challenges uh, when it came to social dialogue, for example. We had a lot of concerns from trade unions, and I think this has to be addressed as well. This is part of the game, but this is an open dialogue, and we stand for this open dialogue here uh, in, the, in the ESC. Together, we will make sure that the advancement of the EU reform agenda goes ahead in full respect of human and labor rights, rule of law, transparency, equality, and through a genuine social dialogue. And uh, as I mentioned, we had our visit to Ukraine in November, and since then uh, we officially launched our initiative for the enlargement candidate members. I think this is a landmark decision uh, of the EESC, and I'm very, very glad to see that all candidate countries, including Ukraine, are involved in this initiative and that we could already uh, welcome civil society representatives at our plenary meetings. We will now continue with this, uh, with this initiative, which means now it comes really to work. Selected opinions where uh, colleagues from candidate countries, including Ukraine, 
will be invited to participate, to contribute to the work. I really encourage you to use this opportunity. We together, we have to make this initiative a success. It must be a success and a role model also for other EU institutions. I'm confident that we will do this and this could serve as a, I would say, as a good example for progressive and tangible integration uh, of a candidate country and of Ukraine into the EU. And I'm really glad that we are the first EU institution that opens its doors for also for uh, Ukraine. Now Ukraine's representatives are included in the work of the committee and can prepare joint positions together with their European colleagues. In addition, this status increases the importance of the Ukrainian civil society platform, which is formed from the same thematic groups that are in the committee. There are working groups dealing with various thematic issues, human rights, environmental protection, social policy, innovation, and political dialogue. The platform was created from three sectors, trade unions, employers, and public organizations. More on the importance of this initiative for Ukraine and the European Union, please welcome ESCK member, chair of the EU side of civil society platform and vice president of the Union of Entrepreneurs and Employers, Marcin Novatsky. First of all, let me stress what is the core business of, of the ECOSOC, of the committee. So we, uh, we work on opinions as a part of legislative procedure in the EU. So if there is a regulation coming out of the commission, uh, it, goes to, uh, it goes to the committee. And then as a voice of, of uh, civil society, we work, we work out opinions too, uh, which is supposed to be balanced between employers, unions, and, and civil society organizations. So this is a very tangible uh, uh, I think impact and uh, uh, and uh, product that is delivered across EU institutions. So your voice now is a part of of that uh, process. So basically, uh, what is the enlargement initiative about? Uh, is that that we invite uh, civil society from candidate countries to join most important opinion school, the work on opinion school, uh, on a regular basis. So I think this is very specific, very tangible, uh, and, and very fresh initiative of President uh, Rocke, uh, which is also a kind of, uh, you know, the message to other institutions. I know the parliament, in a way, is, is really uh, uh, jealous that this is now happening uh, in the committee. And the, the, the great thing is that we have resources, we have the capacity because of you, because of your long-term involvement uh, within the civil society platform to deliver uh, that work, to deliver the, 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 the uh, specific opinions. And uh, one sentence about the enlargement itself, this is one of, I would say, the priority of, of, the, of the house, of the ECOSOC now, uh, to kind of boost the work on the, on the enlargement. We see that, you know, with, given the circumstances and the, the large-scale invasion, uh, we have the momentum to really push uh, for the enlargement. The, the pace is kind of, you know, uh, it is surprising to the number of stakeholders, it's, it's, but it's a very good thing to, to use the momentum and to make sure that we do as much as possible uh, to bring Ukraine and other member uh, candidate countries uh, closer to the EU. Ukraine, of course, as you see, amongst uh, candidate countries is on the, uh, is on the top, is top country and the top pick to to join the EU. So we have uh, definitely uh, lots of responsibility to, to deliver, uh, lots of uh, work uh, to accomplish in terms of, of being closer, uh, understanding institutions, EU institutions, getting ready 
uh, of, of Ukrainian institutions, civil society, employees, unions, group, of course, government to, to be in line with what was what is happening uh, in Brussels and across member states. Because at the end of the day, it's all about members uh, and, uh, and and understanding also socially, politically, economically, the situation in member states uh, is kind of vital to. Uh, uh, also, to, to make sure that the enlargement process is happening, it's not stop, it's, it's not stopping, um, yeah, and that we have the, the whole mapping of of stakeholders that can support the process. EU candidate countries need more than just empty words. They need concrete actions. It is necessary to work more closely than ever with civil society in the candidate countries to ensure that the enlargement members can start their work from 2024. This will help rebuild Ukraine through joint efforts, laying the foundation for a strong and dynamic civil society and start Ukraine's European future today. Andris Gobins, EESC member and president of the European Movement Latvia, will highlight some ideas for a smoother EU integration process for both the state and civil society. The entire European path for Ukraine is thanks to civil society. And this is important for us in EU to understand and for Ukrainian government also to understand that actually the civil society is strong. Uh, clearly democratic and uh, also European civil society is the backbone of everything which you have now and in future. And this needs to be recognized in all processes, in all decision making from the very first minute to the very end. And very, I'm very happy that we also from EU side respond to this reality which exists and that uh, we are the first taking on board a real cooperation with Ukraine, not only for accession talks, but on real matters. And why I say it's a package deal, I would suggest and to make big pressure on EU institutions as well on this. This was important for my country, Latvia, where I come from, is please try to become members in your European networks. Because uh, all organizations, whether it's environment, social, business, wherever, they, there are uh, organizations at EU level, as stronger you will be in these networks, as less stereotypes we will have in our brains and minds, because you, sorry, but you will help us, you will need to help us as well to understand the realities, and, and which means a hard education process for, for for us to learn that actually reality is reality is about Russia, reality is about uh, Ukraine, that, uh, that you are Europeans, we have to understand it, and best uh, understanding is through real cooperation. So this is the, the last fifth point on civil society, and if I might just, sorry for talking so long, but just five ideas perhaps for, for state level and for the entire integration process, what to be learned from Latvia. First of it, uh, EU integration should be under the prime minister, or you have a vice prime minister. That's much better than inline ministry. In Latvia, we made a mistake. We started with prime minister, but now it's a foreign ministry, which is complete disaster. Yeah. Disaster because coordination strategy is better to, to have it under the prime minister. Second, you need the right structures where civil society can play a role. Perhaps it's the time to think of an economic and social committee in Ukraine. So to start now where the window of opportunity is open and to say, okay, we want the platform to be transformed in an economic and social committee with the secretariat, with all the uh, possibilities and uh, uh, impact on, on legislation at national and then on EU level, because both are closely linked. Third suggestion for state level, and this links also to civil society, be self-confident. Don't only react on the things which we do, because there will not be a lot of opinions which we involve you, ask for more. <laughs> and we will definitely, I personally can promise that I will do my up, um, utmost to feed in Ukrainian ideas also in other opinions, forest, windmills, whatever, uh, already in an earlier stage, and we can practice in a wider spectrum than the minimum which is now agreed on uh, in the Economic and Social Committee. And there is enough things Ukraine can be super 
proud with, and I would start actually with the uh, security factor. European Union is not able to defend itself, to, to, to protect its democracies and, and freedoms. Without Ukraine, we will be lost. And that's the, the basic thing. Which we, we cannot talk about uh, green energy, democracy, if we don't have basic freedom from Russia. And this is not able without uh, Ukraine. So the self-confidence, energy sector, feeding the world, the sustainable development goals is not possible without Ukraine. You play a key role on world level. And of course, EU should play, uh, use this potential as well. So be self-confident, set agenda, not only wait for comma changes or, or reaction. You've been watching the special project by Ukraine Media Center, an Euro-Atlantic course dedicated to the Russian-Ukrainian war, Ukraine and Flames. In the description under this video, you can find information on how you can help Ukraine fight Russian aggression. If you find our work useful, please like and share this video. Slava Ukraini!